Okay, hello. Um, okay, so um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today the uh, Maggie and Nick the Wolf um, physics lecture on the God particle. Um, I, so I will be the moderator. Uh, my name is Marcela Carena. Um, I'm a professor of physics at the University of Chicago. I do research at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, and I have the great pleasure of being a member of the Aspen Center for Physics. Uh, but today is all about uh, Professor Kyle Kramer. Uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, introduce him to you today. He's a professor at uh, the, uh, New York, uh, at the University of New York. Uh, he actually is a member of one of the two big experiments uh, that uh, was responsible for discovering uh, the Higgs particle or the God particle. Um, not only that, Kyle has developed uh, the statistical methodology and tools that uh, have been extremely uh, essential in all the uh, process of the Higgs discovery. Uh, Kyle, he did his PhD at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then he was a Goldhaber Fellow at the Brookhaven National Lab, and during, the, during that period, he spent a lot of time at the uh, big CERN uh, laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland, where the particle, the Higgs particle has been discovered. Um, among uh, his many uh, achievements, uh, he was awarded the uh, Presidential Early uh, Career Award uh, from uh, President George W. Bush, and also a corresponding one from the National Science Foundation. Um, let's see, I don't forget anything here. Uh, so I have to say that um, after the, as you probably know, the Higgs was discovered on the 4th of July of uh, 2012 at like 2 a.m. in Chicago time at least. <laughs> and um, um, Kyle, uh, after the Higgs discovery, uh, Kyle appeared with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, to explain <laughs> Uh, the Higgs boson to the American audiences. And in fact, Kyle is in great demand uh, because of his uh, amazing capability to explain science in a very clear and interesting way uh, to the public. Uh, in fact, uh, very shortly, he will appear in a beer commercial. And uh, I don't have <laughs> the slightest idea what beer and Higgs have in common but I'm sure that Kyle will explain us that today. So without further ado, please. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Marcella. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, will, I guess the next lecture will be about how beer and the Higgs have to, what they have to do with each other. Um, I love coming to Aspen. It's really a great place to uh, think about physics. And uh, um, I found out today it's also a great place to dislocate your shoulder. So some of my gesticulating will be subdued, uh, um, and, uh, and, and also just that, well, you here is a testament to just the appreciation of what we are doing, and I think the Aspen Center for Physics is a great, uh, you know, is doing great things. Uh, when I arrived at the airport and got in the taxi, uh, you know, the, I told the driver that I'd like to go to the physics center, and the first thing he said was, thank you for discovering the Higgs boson. I was like, <laughs> you don't get that very often. Yeah, so, um, so, uh, so I, I, I think that, uh, you're you know, hopefully familiar to some degree that this, this amazing discovery happened. So just in uh, a few months ago, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Francois Anglaire and Peter Higgs, and I'll just read it here, for their theoretical uh, discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass of subatomic particles, and which was recently confirmed through the discovery of the, this particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN. So I, as uh, Marcella mentioned, I'm on the Atlas experiment, so we didn't get to share in the Nobel Prize, but we at least got a, our name dropped, so that was good. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, the Higgs and the discovery, and then kind of give you a feel of where we're going after that, because uh, uh, it's an interesting story. So we're talking about fundamental particles and things like that, the fundamental uh, ingredients of nature. So if you think about ordinary matter being composed of atoms, 
uh, the atoms have a cloud of electrons orbiting around a nucleus, and the nucleus is made out of protons and neutrons, and those protons and neutrons are in turn made out of quarks. So we think of particles like the electron and particles like the quarks as being fundamental particles. And we just have this very small table of 12 fundamental particles, which is much you know, smaller than like the periodic table with hundreds and hundreds of elements. So this is a very minimalist, concise description of, every, you know, of everything that we've ever seen on Earth and, and, and uh, even more. And we think of four fundamental forces for how these particles interact with each other. So there's gravity, which is probably the most, uh, the most uh, familiar. There's the electromagnetic force, uh, which if you've ever played with magnets, you, you, know, you have some feel for. It's uh, responsible for all of chemistry, um, how light works, uh, how your cell phone communicates. Um, you know, so this is probably one of the most important forces, I'd say. And then there are two less familiar forces called the strong and the weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is related to radioactivity, and the strong nuclear force is the thing that stops the positively charged protons from flying away from each other inside of the nucleus. Ouch. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, all of this structure, the matter and these interactions, are encompassed in a very concise mathematical equation, which we're not going to go through. But I just want to show you. Um, it's amazing that every, really, everything that we've ever done in a, you know, in, on Earth is really, it, for physicists, can be you know, wrapped up into this one equation. It takes uh, you know, graduate school kind of training to be able to understand what this equation is doing. But it's very concise and very beautiful and really like an enormous achievement of mankind and something we should all be proud of. Um, but there was a particle a problem because in the, in the process of developing this theory, it was sort of working really well, but there was this internal consistency problem that somehow the equations really only worked if all the particles were massless. And we know the particles aren't massless. Uh, so, um, so this was something that needed to be resolved and people worried about it for, for quite a while. And that's where Peter Higgs comes in. So Peter Higgs added this uh, scrawl on the blackboard, which was part of that equation I showed you. And basically, he came up with a very clever way to keep the mathematical consistency of that theory while being able to give particles mass. And um, so I'll tell you just a little bit about that. But I want you to remember this picture in the background, because I'll show you again later. It's, it's part of this, uh, of this story. OK. So, um, so this is from a cartoon that I think is really nice about uh, trying to explain what the Higgs is all about. And he says, well, the, the Higgs starts with this. You need to imagine that there's a field that permeates the universe. And you already lose a lot of people when you just use the word field, right? So if you've ever played with magnets, you can't see what's going on between the magnets, but they're pushing on each other, and there's a magnetic field between them. There's some invisible something going on there. So just that's what I want you to think about. So it's just like that. There's a new kind of field, and we call it the Higgs field. So there's something that's permeating the universe. And every particle that's you know, moving along, doing its own business, is moving through this field. And some of the particles interact very strongly with this field, and some barely interact at all. And the way that we think of it is that the particles that interact very strongly have a large mass, and the particles that barely interact have a small mass. So usually you see this idea that the particles are slowed down. That is not such a good analogy, because you know, when you throw a, part, a baseball, it doesn't come to a stop because it's heavy, right? It has inertia. So you shouldn't really think that it's slowed down, but its inertia comes from interacting with this field. OK, fine. But if you think about that carefully, it maybe that's not very satisfying, because we've just turned one problem into a different problem. Why do particles have different masses is now turned into why do they interact more or less strongly with the Higgs field. So we haven't explained in a fundamental way why particles have the masses that they do. That's still an open question. Uh, but if this picture is correct, it comes with a, a prediction that we should see a new particle. And that's the Higgs boson. So it's not, just, uh, it's not just a sleight of hand. There's a real physical prediction. And that's why we went out to go check. And we've been looking for this thing since 1964. So it took quite a while. So this is where we've been doing the big business, uh, flying into Geneva, Switzerland. You see Lake, Lake Geneva there. We're going to see a little ring that's about 17 miles around. That's the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and it's buried about 300 feet underground. This is the lab uh, you know, where we, we control all of this stuff. So here you see that ring going around. That's 17 miles around. And then there are these very, very large caverns where you have these particle detectors, which are about the size of an 11-story building. Okay? And every nook and cranny of this 11-story building is filled with state-of-the-art electronics. Normally, you're not allowed to walk on it, but you know. Um, so this is the biggest 
machine humans have ever constructed. So this has you know, been an enormous, enormous effort. You've contributed to that with your taxpayer dollars, so we thank you. Um, and uh, here's a picture of what Atlas looks like. So here you see a person. Um, this is while it was still being constructed. Now every nook and cranny is filled with electronics. And then on the other side of the ring is our friendly competitor, CMS. Um, C stands for compact. It doesn't really look very compact uh, either. But uh, so these are they're sort of on par with each other. We've chosen different strategies, but they're they're very much equal uh, competitors. Uh, and we provide cross checks for each other. So this is one of the parts of the CMS uh, detector. Does anyone want to guess what this clear block is made out of? Looks like glass or what? Quartz. Quartz. That's a pretty good guess. Yeah, uh, lucite. Yeah. So, that is a, a, a almost a, a, a clear brick of lead. It's lead tungstate. And when I heard that, I, this was my reaction. Transparent aluminum? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the Star Wars movie, but I saw that. And I, yeah, it's just, that was my reaction when I, when I first saw it. So, so the, there you go. So all these different parts of the detector you know, use different strategies. And, the, and when particles come flying into them, they leave different patterns. And it's our business to go try to understand those patterns and figure out what's going on in these collisions. So the other big part is the actual uh, thing that accelerates these particles to incredibly high energy. So this, this is the 17-mile tunnel filled with superconducting magnets. The whole thing is superconducting magnets. And this little, these two uh, ribbon-thin are beams of particles. They're protons. They're accelerated to essentially the speed of light. That beam has as much energy as a jumbo jet when it's flying. You could melt seven tons of copper with it. Uh, you don't want to stick your hand in it. Um, and so it accelerates these particles, and they go around that ring uh, you know, thousands and thousands of times a second, and they interact and the, they collide in the middle of these huge particle detectors, which you should think of like big digital cameras. So there's so much energy that it's not that you're breaking things apart. You're actually producing new particles that weren't there before through Einstein's E equals MC squared. So you have so much energy that you can make a little bit of mass, and you hope that you might make a new kind of particle like a Higgs boson that wasn't there before. It's not that you just go and find it, you actually produce it. And so in this example, this is a real collision where you see four particles flying out, which we think are the remnants of a, having produced a Higgs that then immediately decayed into these four particles, and that's what we see in our detector. So uh, we did this, but it takes a lot of tries because it's very hard to make a Higgs boson. So we had not a thousand and not a million or 10 million, we had a quadrillion collisions in the last couple of years, and that's about how many, that's uh, if you take a quadrillion grains of sand to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool to give you some sort of feel. So then from that huge number of collisions, we go looking for, we found roughly a few thousand that are candidates for the Higgs boson. So imagine you know, taking your hand, coloring those like sand grains red, mixing them up in the Olympic-sized swimming pool, and then you have to go find them. That's our job. So a needle in a haystack is nothing. So, so we did it, and we found one like this that was taken on December 12th and May 23rd. And you see in this picture a little yellow splotch and another little yellow splotch. Those are energy deposits that, that came from photons, particles of light that hit the detector. And this is exactly what was predicted if you make a Higgs boson. So this was a candidate for the Higgs. And here's another one. There's four particles these red lines that were able to go all the way through this 11-story size detector, you know, that's filled with electronics and metal and stuff. So there's only one kind of particle that can do that. It's called a muon. And there are four of them in this event. And that's incredibly rare. And this is also a candidate for the Higgs. So when we saw them, we were like incredibly excited. OK, um, whoops. For some reason, she wasn't excited. I don't know why. But everyone else is excited. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and so uh, then, but we didn't claim discovery right away. We had to collect more and more data. And, and then through this careful statistical analysis, we saw a little bump here and a sort of bigger looking bump over here. And the, the mass that these bumps uh, happen aligns with each other. And the size of the bumps and all the characteristics were exactly what we expected for the Higgs. And because of that, on July 4th, we announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. And it was a, you know, really a tremendous moment you had you know, hundreds of young students at 3 o'clock in the morning waiting to go see it. And it was news all around the world. Peter Higgs was in the audience, you know, weeping uh, that his, you know, sort of life's work had come to fruition. The next day, there was a, uh, uh, you know, the, the newspapers and et cetera knew all about it. I bought about 20 New York Times to give to my family. Um, so this was great. 
And, uh, but it was funny because right after that happened, I came to Aspen, and uh, I want to tell this story for a moment, is that um, you know, in, we celebrated for a little bit, but I was here, and instead of thinking about physics, I was up to my elbows and commas and semicolons and colors of plots as we prepared this for the journals, to send you know, to the journals. And, uh, and then I went on a hike one day up to one of the, the 14ers, and then I came back, and I was sitting in a hot tub, and uh, some other people joined us in the hot tub, and they said, oh, what do you do? And they're like, oh, we're physicists. He's like, oh, yeah, I hear you had a big discovery. That's great. And they're like, yeah, that's what we do. That's great. You know about it. He's like, what do you do? And the, and the one guy says, I buy things from China for as cheap as possible, and I sell them for as much as possible. And I was like, okay, you know, I understand that. You're apparently working out pretty well for you. Uh, and then I asked the other guy, what do you do? And he said, uh, well, uh, I run a specialty scrap company, and I made my first millions scrapping the superconducting super collider in, uh, in, in Dallas. So if you remember this, the superconducting super collider would have run at, you know, five times the, the LHC energy, and we would have discovered this particle almost 10 years ago. So it was just very ironic to me that right after the discovery, you know, here I'm, this guy made millions scrapping it. So anyways... Uh, time went on. Um, at the end of the year, the journal of Science called it the breakthrough of the year. It was all, you know, lots of hoopla. It was great. Um, and I just want to say that it's really difficult to overstate how important this discovery is, uh, but, it, but it is possible. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, a lot of physicists really, you know, don't like this idea of calling it the God particle, but okay, there it is. Um, but, uh, but one of the things that I want to get at is that you know, before I showed you this picture of the standard model that looked like the periodic table, right? And the, that, when I look at that, I think you could add another row or another column and you could just keep adding things to it, right? Like what dictates its size. But this theory is really very tightly knit and it's a complete theory at this point. So this is a new graphic, uh, which I like for the standard model that really kind of indicates that this theory is complete. And you're, you have the Higgs in the middle, kind of uh, the keystone of the whole story that's doing something very uh, important. And this is going to be an achievement for mankind forever, even if we end up revising this theory, because it's an excellent, excellent description of nature. And uh, you know, this was just really a triumph of you know, human ingenuity. Uh, but when you, do, when you present it this way, people also think, so are you done? You, know, you completed this theory, so what's next, right? So that's what I want to kind of get, get into, is to tell you about what's next and the kind of funny things that the Higgs uh, um, uh, leads to, which is what the second half of the title, a, a natural disaster. So, so let's get into that. So this is a picture of uh, some galaxies and things like that. Does anyone notice anything kind of weird looking about this picture? Yeah, you see how it kind of looks like a sort of bubble or something? And you can, these funny elongated features look like long arcs. So uh, this big bright galaxy in the middle is incredibly massive. And there are some other things really far away behind it. And this thing, the gravity of that is warping space and time, and it's lensing the light behind it. It's like you put, you know, so it's, it's distorting the image behind it, and we call that gravitational lensing. And that's really cool. I mean, that's amazing. You know, Einstein's theory is just like really on display here. Um, but it also allows us to, to sort of measure the mass of that galaxy. And then we can compare it to what we think should be there from all the stars, and it turns out that they don't match. And we think that there must be a lot of what we call dark matter. And dark matter was not part of that story that I told you. It's not part of the standard model. We know it's there, definitely know it's there, but we don't know what its particle-like nature is. So we are not done. We need to figure out dark matter and many other mysteries that are out there. So dark matter, I love this picture. This is a simulation of the dark matter in the universe. It really forms kind of the scaffolding or like the skeleton on which the different galaxies and the, and the stars formed. So th there's this amazing cosmic web of dark matter that's out there and we know quite a bit about it. And uh, there's also this, um, this amazing uh, feature that you can take you know, uh, uh, satellites in space and look out at the universe way, 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 way back in time to when the universe was about 400,000 years old. And actually, before that, the universe was opaque. And so you're looking literally at what the universe looked like a very, very long time ago in something called the cosmic microwave background. And, uh, and you can study that, and you get some data with some funny wiggles. But we understand those wiggles so well that it allows us to actually measure the contents of the universe. And when we, do, when we do that, we find that ordinary matter, the stuff that's in the standard model that we know so well, only accounts for about 5% of the mass of the universe. Five times more is dark matter. 
So there's a lot of stuff out there we don't understand. And then there's something called dark energy that's about two thirds of the energy budget of the universe. And we really don't know what that is either. So, so these are the kinds of mysteries that we're trying to uh, address now. And, uh, and I just want to go a little bit uh, more on this to, to say how particle physics, the things we do at the Large Hadron Collider, and these kinds of things relate to each other. So here's a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope looking out at galaxies and things. And of course, if you look at something very, very far away, it took a long time for the light to get to us, right? So you're looking at what it looked like a long time ago. It's like looking back in time, back towards the Big Bang. And at one point, you hit this period where the universe becomes opaque, and telescopes aren't going to take you any, any farther. And so this very early period of the universe is what we're studying at the Large Hadron Collider, where the universe is going through all sorts of amazing transitions, and that's what we want to understand. So here's a picture of Atlas, and it gives you kind of a feel for the energy scales, like how far back in time we are probing what the universe was like. And you see all these kinds of particles that we've seen, the force carriers, the top quark, and now the Higgs boson had a question mark. Now you can remove that question mark. It's an old graphic, I guess. We've seen two of the forces, the weak and the electromagnetic force, unify. We just, that's what that kind of means. We've just seen forces unify. And now we have more questions, like what is dark matter? And then there are other theories, like supersymmetry, or the idea that there might be additional uh, directions to space and time. These are kinds of things that we're studying at the LHC now. And, uh, and this is pretty, you know, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, so, so I want to switch a little bit to say, like, OK, this is what we're interested in. This is what we're studying. But how is it that we can, that we can even think that experiments we do on Earth can extrapolate to something like this? So, so I'm going to try to kind of convince you a little bit about that. And it's based on this conceptual framework that's just been fantastically successful um, that's based on three giant pillars. One is relativity from Einstein. The other is quantum mechanics. And the third is field theory, OK? Now, we put together a little committee to try to come up with a good name for this amazing theory. And we decided to call it relativistic quantum field theory. Not very catchy, uh, but it definitely does the job. Um, so again, the field part of it, you should think about like a bar magnet and the magnetic field around it, these kinds of fields that we were talking about. So that's one component. Relativity, you've heard some of these ideas. There's, for instance, the idea that light is a wave, but what is it a wave in? It's a, an electromagnetic wave, and it turns out that it's always going at the speed of light, no matter what you do. And Einstein figured out how that works, and it led to the conclusion that space and time are related to each other in some very interesting way. And it also led to the idea that E equals MC squared. Um, and then there's quantum mechanics, uh, which is you know, what, what really one of the most revolutionary, and it came around in the sort of 1920s. And one of the ingredients of that is this thing of called a wave-particle duality, that, for instance, electrons that we think of as particles sometimes behave like waves, like when you shoot them out and you have a couple of slits, instead of seeing it uh, the electrons go through one path or the other, they act like waves and they interfere with each other and you get these funny looking fringe patterns in the background. And that's kind of a strange thing, strange property of quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, conversely, light, which we think of as a wave, is actually made out of particles, made out of photons. So there's this dual description. And so there, that's where the Higgs comes in, is that uh, if you think of the Higgs field, the waves on the Higgs field are the Higgs particle, the Higgs boson. So that's how the Higgs field and the Higgs boson are related. It's really through this kind of, this kind of picture. OK, so you put all of these together. And so let me just tell you how successful this has been. So there is a property uh, of, of particles called spin. It has to do, you can sort of think of a little top spinning around. And, uh, and when you talk about uh, this, uh, one of the properties of spin is something I'm not going to explain. I'll just call it g, OK? And if you use quantum mechanics, you would say that this, this number should be 2. That's the prediction. And it's basically 2. That was great. But, uh, but when we came up with, when we went past quantum mechanics into this relativistic quantum field theory, there was the idea that you get corrections based on these funny looking diagrams that we draw all the time from Feynman. And when you take those into account, you get a very small correction. It's not 2. It's 2 plus uh, a little bit, OK? And this theory is so predictive, we can, we can calculate at this point, about 10 decimal points. And we can also go measure that to the same level of precision. So this is equivalent precision is a hole in one from New York to China. That's how accurate the prediction and the experiment is. OK, so this is not a run of the, there's no other field in science that does stuff like this, OK? So you should take, you should take this, this, this conceptual framework very, very seriously. Now, 
It turns out that the Higgs also gets corrections. There's the idea that it has a mass that you kind of start with, and then you get funny looking pictures like this that lead to corrections to the Higgs mass. But instead of being a small correction, like going from you know, two to just a little bit more than two, uh, so this was like a very small correction, like one part in a thousand, the corrections to the Higgs are very large. In fact, they're very, very large. Uh, the size of these corrections usually we would think of as being a quadrillion times larger than the mass of the Higgs that we just measured. So that's really weird, right? You start with something and you get a little correction to it, so naively we would expect the Higgs to be incredibly heavy and not something that we could discover on Earth. Okay, but we did see it and it's there, so we have a mystery. And this, this is a problem, this is this naturalness problem and I'm gonna try to flesh it out a little bit. So the, the idea that I want you to think of is that these two parts, you have two different pieces, they sort of, one is a positive part and one is a negative part, and I wanna make an analogy with the budget, okay? So the, the thing that would be so strange, so unnatural about this theory is if, imagine, you know, this is so hard to imagine, that the people that are spending the money and the people that are raising the money aren't very well coordinated with each other, but let's imagine it's completely uncoordinated. You just have people taxing and people spending, they don't talk to each other, and uh, you raise, you know, you have both of them, so the income would be like positive contributions to the Higgs mass, spending would be negative contributions to the Higgs mass, and the surplus or deficit would be like the physical Higgs mass. That's what we just saw. Now, if you, if you wanna make the, the sort of analogy for the, the, the uh, size of our budget, which is a sort of a few trillion dollars, we would be balancing the budget to about uh, a thousandth of a penny. That's pretty good, right? Especially when people aren't talking to each other, right? So if that was happening, you might think, hmm, that's kind of weird, that's kind of unnatural, right? Uh, and somehow, how is it that it's so finely tuned that these numbers cancel to such a small degree? And this, this uh, analogy, I actually I've been talking to some of my physicist friends, and we like it a lot because it goes even more. This idea of the fiscal year, like how the year and you see the budget growing, is a lot like the, the energy scale that we're probing. You know, like what is the ultimate energy scale of the universe? And, uh, and also the idea that, for instance, if you wanna compare $2,008 to $1940, usually you wanna adjust for inflation. And that's almost exactly one of the trickiest concepts in physics that I know of, which is this idea of renormalization. So I like this analogy a lot. And it, it, we can flush it out a little bit more even, because all these different kinds of uh, corrections are sort of like the different parts of the budget. And as you know the budget, there are small slices of the pie and big slices of the pie. And the important ones are, for instance, Social Security and the military and Medicare. And those are like these top diagrams. Um, so when the Higgs interacts with the top quark, that's the really big guy. That's the, the big thing in the budget that you want to understand. So now let's try to think about if I wanted to, if, if I thought it was so un, unnatural that the budget was balanced so well, I would might think, well, how is that working? Maybe there's some sort of principle. Maybe it's not just a, a coincidence. Maybe there's some underlying principle to balance the budget. For instance, maybe someone came to Washington with an amendment to balance the budget. And they said, you know, whenever, for every dollar of expenditures, you need to have a dollar of revenue, right? Well, that's an exact analogy to this idea of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a theory that says for every kind of particle that's what's called a boson, there's one called a fermion, and so those lead to these two kinds of drawings, but one comes in with a positive correction and one comes in with a negative correction, and they exactly cancel. So there's like, this is, this is one of the two solutions that has been thought up over the last several decades to solve this naturalness problem or this fine-tuning problem that has really been the kind of central problem for theoretical physics for the last several decades. So, so this is a, I like this analogy. Um, now, there's more to the Higgs that's kind of interesting, which is that um, if you w wiggle its properties very much, the universe could be a very different place. Like you, in some situations, you might not ever form atoms, then you would not have life or stars or anything. Um, in other situations, the universe would curl up into a little ball and it would never be big enough to even be interesting. And, and it turns out that, you know, you really, there's a very kind of narrow sliver of, of situations that allow life to form. And that's one of the other big mysteries that we're trying to understand, another type of fine tuning. And so one of the things that we found out, for instance, is related to this story, is that here's a, a, one of my few plots that has, a, this direction is the mass of the Higgs, and this is the mass of the top quark. And as you a, adjust those things, this picture that I showed you, this is the picture that was behind Peter Higgs on his chalkboard. 
This picture and this black line is supposed to be sort of taking a, a slice out of that, okay? Uh, that, that thing that looks like a nice uh, sombrero hat also gets little corrections to it. And depending on the, the mass of the top quark, for instance, if I start at the bottom and I start going up, these corrections start making this, this picture look a little bit different and a little bit different. And if the mass of the top quark gets into this yellow region, which is called metastability uh, in, the, in the plot, then the picture looks like this. And so while our universe is sort of sitting over here, uh, it's like if you dropped a marble, it would roll down the hill and it's sitting right here, that's how we understand our universe. If this is actually the picture, it's not gonna stay that way. The universe at some point will, we say, tunnel, and it will go from this point to this point. And when that happens, you don't wanna be around. The universe will, it will be like an explosion that we have no analog for. The universe will just kind of unfurl itself into some other form and it will expand at the speed of light, and it will be a very different place after that. Um, and so we think about the, you know, the universe as being unstable in this way, and that's kind of strange. So if this is the picture we had before from the Big Bang, there was this period of inflation and the universe is sort of evolving along. At some point, if the universe is metastable like that, at some point, like you know, tomorrow across the street, uh, you could have a little spot where you would have essentially another Big Bang, bloop, and it would just, change its, its form and this new universe would unfurl from that spot. And maybe in another spot, another universe would happen. And this idea of, uh, is actually a, a real idea that we take very seriously and it's related to something that in popular terms has started to be called the multiverse. So the idea there is that you start with this universe and it's constantly spitting out lots of other little universes and they can have very different properties. And this is another sort of conceptual way of trying to solve this fine tuning problem that's coming around is that maybe some of these numbers that we don't understand and some of these coincidences aren't really to be explained. Maybe they actually are coincidences, but you just have an enormous number of little sections of the universe where the features of those universe are, are very, very different. So the red and the blue and the green would all look very different. Some, and most of them would not have, for instance, atoms. They wouldn't have life, they'd be all curled up or they would be expanding and there would be nothing in them, uh, who knows? But of course, you're only going to find yourself living in the universes that are right for life. So maybe the reason that these, these, uh, this miraculous cancellation happens is just because you couldn't live in, an, in a world that doesn't have a balanced economy or something like that. So this is a very, very different way of thinking about physics. It's a very controversial idea, but uh, the, the Higgs and this natural disaster has pushed us into thinking about these kinds of things and uh, invoking ideas of what's called the anthropic principle, this idea that you know, the very fact that we're here to see the universe tells us that you're only going to live in the you know, yellow blob over here. And that seems very unsatisfying, right? You, know, you somehow lost this predictive explanatory power of physics and you're kind of trading it in for this random randomness. But I wanna make another analogy, which goes back to Johannes Kepler. So Johannes Kepler, this was right after the sort of revolution that the sun is in the center of our solar system and the earth is going around the sun. And, uh, and we knew about uh, six planets, uh, or sorry, five planets at the time. And, and they were trying to understand why the orbits, the radius of the orbits were what they were. And uh, so lots of people were trying to explain this. And Johannes Kepler had this epiphany that, oh, maybe, there are five platonic solids, like the, the cube and the tetrahedron and the octahedron and all these things. Maybe they're all fitting inside of each other and they're like spheres circumscribed and inscribed and this very funny geometrical picture for what's going on. And if you do that, the, the radius of these spheres is very close to the radius of the planets. And he thought he had like figured it out. He'd cracked the code and uh, you know, that's why the planets are the way they are. But of course now that we think this is completely silly, um, of, and we don't really even think that it's a scientific question to try to understand why our solar system has the, the, the orbits that they do. In particular, that point has been driven home by an experiment named after Kepler called, uh, that has seen thousands of other planets around other solar systems and stars outside of ours. And this is a catalog of all of the solar systems, uh, several hundred solar systems the Kepler mission has found and they all have different shapes and sizes. And now you can ask yourself, if most of these aren't habitable for life, but they're all over the place, where would you expect to find yourself, right? You're only going to find yourself on the ones that are habitable for life. So this is very, very much like the multiverse idea, and it, it has a historical precedent. So now, 
we wouldn't try to explain why our solar system has the orbits it does because there's an idea that there's a whole bunch of them. It's just not a scientific question. And so maybe that's the case with this fine tuning and the Higgs mass and things like that. Maybe it's, there's not something to be explained. Maybe it's just basically happenstance, which uh, is an interesting place to go. So anyways, I'll end again with this. This picture of the standard model and the discovery of the Higgs, really a tremendous achievement. And, uh, and this picture, I like to think of it as like a, as a menu, and hopefully the Higgs is really the appetizer, and coming is the main, which will either be something like supersymmetry, which might explain dark matter as the side, or extra dimensions, which would come with the side of microscopic black holes, or maybe it's the multiverse, right? So the only difference is that you don't get to choose. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your night. <laughs> We still don't know what the beer and the fruit Oh, right. Is. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, maybe someone has done that. Uh, so thank you, Khan, for this very uh, beautiful presentation. So now uh, we have some time for you to ask questions and for Kyle to do the best to answer them. Yes. So. Yes, please. <laughs> what do you, how do you explain the opacity of the universe at CGZ? Right. So the, the question was, how do you understand why the universe was opaque, uh, and then made this transition to being uh, transparent. So um, if, you, if you're at a very high energy, uh, and this you can do here, you know, uh, the, the atoms, the electrons going around the atoms will get stripped off, and it will be ionized, and you call that a plasma. So for instance, a flame is like a kind of plasma. And light has a hard time going through a plasma because there are all these charged electrons floating around, and so it's bouncing off the electrons constantly. And, and so that's why it was opaque. Uh, and then as the universe cooled down, uh, it, the electrons uh, weren't free anymore. They settled down into little atoms. So at first, they're all just flying around, and then they settle down into atoms. And at that moment, I mean, it must have been amazing. You know, the universe just went woof, and it was like totally clear at that point. And uh, so that's the, yes, please. So now that you found the Higgs, do you need a larger collider? Yes. <laughs> the question was, do we need a larger collider? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, right now, the field is going through this process where about prioritizing our future for the sort of next 10 years. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is being upgraded right now, and in, a, in about a year from now, we're going to, we're not running right now, so in a year from now, we'll turn back on at about twice the energy, which was actually what we were hoping to do originally, but we had some hiccups. Um, and with that, we will have, a, we'll open up the frontier and the threshold for discovery. And there's a very good chance that we might be able to see supersymmetric particles or dark matter, and that could happen in the first year or two after turning on. So definitely in a couple of years, you should be looking out for some big news. If we don't see something right away, it's not that we fail, it's maybe just not <laughs> there to be found, and then it will take some more time, and it might require, uh, if you really want to directly see it, it might require a larger Experiment. So we're talking about that, but that's a, you know, decades away and a very big project. Uh, and in the meantime, there are lots of other very clever ideas like this, these very precise measurements. And um, so this conference that we're having this week is all about the, the you know, huge array of options and how they all connect to each other to try to make progress beyond. And it's, so it's not just the big colliders. Yes, please. That's a great question. So the, the standard model you know, sort of technically is, is doesn't include gravity. It's only these other three forces. Um, using the same conceptual framework that I talked about, you can try to think about how gravity would come into the mix. And there, that the force carrier of gravity would be the graviton. And so there's a, you can definitely talk about a theory that's based on that same framework. And, uh, uh, and so then there's uh, the first ideas, though, turned out that they didn't think that that theory was going to work. This quantum theory of gravity looks like it has some problems. Uh, some people debate about whether or not that's the real problems or not, so it's, a, it's one of the sort of cutting edge topics. Uh, but trying to solve that question is what led to the idea of string theory. Uh, so there are various ideas about trying to solve that. So it's not really part of the standard model, but the graviton is part of the same conceptual framework. And the question is if you, that conceptual framework is up to the job or if you need to replace it with a new one like superstring theory. Yeah. 
Okay, so the, the question was to try to uh, share some theoretical considerations of what an extra dimension might look like. Um, uh, the, I, I think that, so we know about three, three directions, right? Up and down, left and right, forward and back, and uh, left and right, forward and back. And, uh, and so we don't see any other direction, right? So, um, so one of the ideas uh, to be compatible with what we, we, what we know about is that these extra directions, if they're there, um, they're not, uh, they're kind of wrapped up like into little circles and things like that. And if those little circles are very, very, very small, then we just wouldn't really see them, right? So you, uh, and uh, so an analogy that's made is if you look at a tightrope walker or something like that, they're walking along a string, that string looks like it's just a one dimensional object. Uh, but uh, if you had a, an ant walking along that string and you zoomed way in, the ant would realize that the string has some thickness and they would be able to tell that it's not a one dimensional thing, it's sort of a you know, three dimensional looking thing. So, um, so to do that, you need to have basically a very good microscope and be able to resolve these very small distance scales. And that's exactly what the Large Hadron Collider is. It's basically like an enormous microscope. So, so it depends on how big these extra dimensions are. If they're big enough, we can resolve them. If they're even smaller, you would need to go to even higher energy kinds of collisions. Mm -hmm. Are they, they're like, in essence, particles that, that fill the void, but what, how do you get more and more and more and more of those filling the void, or do they spread out, and there's more distance between them? Uh, other questions similarly related. Is there any indication of space and time and quantum? Uh, right, so there are two questions. One was somehow trying to get a, wrap your head around when the universe is expanding, sort of how you can understand like what, you know, what's filling in the gaps, I think, to some degree. Um, and then the other one was about if there's any evidence for space and time being quantized. So I'll take that one first. At this point, there's, there's no evidence about space and time being quantized in that way. Um, so when you get into some of the ideas related to, you know, there's some competitors of ideas like string theory that really push in that direction. But um, any phenomena like this, as far as we know, would, would be a, would require very, very high energy collisions to be able to see it or something like that. So we, have, we don't have any evidence of that now other than theoretical motivation. Um, in terms of the universe expanding, um, the, the, the particles, if you think of them not as like little points, but you think of them as being related to these waves on these fields, then I think it's easier to understand what's going on because you don't have this discrete picture of, of something. You, you think about this continuous field and little waves on it. And then as the universe is expanding, you know, everything is just kind of stretching out. So, um, so if you, maybe it's like thinking about a, a rubber sheet or something, and as you stretch it, the universe, that, you know, space and time are stretching, and the, these fields are stretching along with it. So, um, and then you can have, so for instance, light. You know, one of the things that's confusing, though maybe this will help, is that you can have two points uh, that are separating themselves faster than kind of the speed of light, but nothing is moving faster than the speed of light. You're just creating space between them. So the way I like to think of it is that you're running as fast as you can at the speed of light on like a rubber trample, you know, piece of rubber, and people are stretching out the rubber. And even though you're running really fast, you know, that you can still see that the person pulling on the rubber over there is like receding away from you. And so, um, so I don't know if that helps, but uh, you, if you think of it as sort of a nice continuous rubber sheet picture instead of like little particles filling the void, it's maybe easier to, to picture. Uh, yes, please. Um, right, so the question was, if atoms are mostly empty space, you know, then like, why am I not falling through the floor, I think is roughly the question. Um, well, the, I, I mean, it's true that they're mostly empty space, but they're, you know, they can still sort of, you know, the, the electron likes to go around the nucleus of the atom, and it's, it makes into a little ball, you know, and, uh, and um, 
And when it runs into another atom that's close by, they bump into each other, you know, and then maybe, or maybe they form a chemical bond or something and they like to be stuck next to each other. So it's true that there's mainly empty space, but they're interacting with each other uh, a lot. So it's really the interactions that are, uh, you know, that give that sense of rigidity. Um, one thing that's kind of fascinating is that how is it that, that you know, this piece of plywood or whatever I'm standing on is, is able to overcome all of the gravity of the earth underneath me, right? And that's one of the nice ways to see this huge uh, uh, asymmetry or hierarchy between the strengths of the fundamental forces. So gravity is so weak, you know, that even though there's a whole earth of pulling gravity towards me, that these little particles and the mostly empty space and the, and the you know, electrical forces between them are able to f keep me here and not falling through the floor. And that's actually another way to think about the, this uh, fine tuning problem. Uh, so those, those questions are related. Oh, yeah. So the question was, where did I get those gorgeous graphics? Luckily, uh, a project of this size usually in, has a lot of you know, outreach and graphics people, and they do, they do amazing work. So I kind of pick and choose. And uh, if you go to the, uh, you know, if you just type for CERN, uh, for instance, you, it will take you there. And they, have, they do a lot of great work for public outreach, and there's material from, for kids to more in-depth material, lots of stuff on YouTube. I mean, there is a tremendous amount of material, and uh, some of it is just very high quality. Um, so, um, yeah, if you ser search for CERN or the LHC or something like that, I think you'll find uh, quite a bit of material. That's an excellent question. So there, one of the questions was, does the Higgs boson give mass to dark matter? Um, so right now we think of the Higgs as giving mass to all the particles that we know about in the, in the standard model. Um, so you would think maybe it just gives mass to everything. And, and it, uh, so we have a, some world experts here. Uh, so the, um, the, when you talk about something like uh, supersymmetry, for instance, which has a candidate for what dark matter would be, there is another mechanism to give mass to particles. Uh, and so, so the, we don't know yet uh, if there is dark matter. It could be that some of its mass comes from interacting with the Higgs and some comes from this other uh, type of procedure. But what's interesting is that depending on how much of its mass comes from the Higgs, it has a big influence on how likely we are to be able to, to detect dark matter in underground experiments. We have these experiments that are very quiet, sitting underground, hoping that a little dark matter particle smacks into something and we can see it. And, uh, and the chance that it makes that interaction is, has to do with how much of its mass comes from the Higgs. Yes, sir. How does, it, how does dark matter get distributed the way you imply that it's distributed in graphics? Right. Uh, whew, that's an, another good question. So the, the question was, uh, how, does, how did dark matter get distributed the way it is? I showed that cool-looking, spiderweb-looking picture of dark matter, and you know, why is it not just kind of uniformly spread out? So, Part of, that, um, part of that comes from the idea that at the very, very beginning of the universe, when it was first created, it wasn't perfectly smooth, uh, that there, there were little fluctuations we call quantum fluctuations, and those things uh, grew, and so there would be like a little bit of some area where there's kind of a little bit more or a little bit less stuff. So there's some initial inhomogeneity or perturbation that, that seeded some of that structure. And then another part is the fact that dark matter has mass, and so it's going to be attracted gravitationally, and maybe there's some level of interaction there, and so it kind of spirals around and does its thing. So if you took a bunch of dust, for instance, it would gravitationally collapse, and it would start to spin around and things, and that's how stars were made, for instance. And, and, but So you can do these sim simulations. Dark matter would be a very different story because it doesn't interact very much. It, it basically just flies right through itself. Uh, but when you take everything that we do know about dark matter and you stick it into those simulations, uh, you get uh, something like uh, the, the images that I, that I showed you. That's a, not an artist's conception. That's a serious scientific simulation of, of what we think dark matter looks like. I don't know if that's totally satisfying, but yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, how does the Higgs boson fit into or uh, relate to string theory? Um, one way of turning it around is that any theory of any string theory that's going to work 
needs to predict the Higgs boson. <laughs> um, so um, it, it, string theory allows for you know lots of different kinds of particles. Again, it's not really a specific theory. It's like a frame. It's like a framework, a conceptual framework for how to build theory. So uh, you don't have any problem sort of in the same way using the the conceptual framework I call quantum field theory. You say like you sort of add the ingredients, and the Higgs is one of those ingredients. And in string theory, it would be an ingredient, but it would just have a kind of take on a different form. Yes, please. In the <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually an excellent point. They, they, these aren't uh, exclusive of each other. Um, so, um, well, supersymmetry is really beautiful. One of the things that's nice about it is this. We think about space and time as having symmetry. So, for instance, there's, there's no preferred direction. So there's a rotational symmetry. And there's no preferred spot. This spot and that spot are kind of on equal footing. So there's a, we call it translational symmetry. And in time, you know, this point in time and then, you know, a year from now are fundamentally the same in physics. And so, um, so those symmetries drive a lot of what we do. Einstein told us there was one other kind of symmetry that related space and time. And when you paired that with quantum mechanics, it made a prediction that there should be antiparticles. And that's like, and it was confirmed. You know, it's an amazing feat of the human intellect to make such a you know, bold uh, prediction like that, and it was true. So it turns out that you can show mathematically there's only one more kind of symmetry that's available to you, and it seems like nature would just love to realize it, and uh, that's called supersymmetry. So I think that's very compelling, and it gives you this nice uh, idea for dark matter. And if it's true, our understanding of, you know, it'd be as, it would be as big of a revolution of our understanding of space and time as what Einstein did. So that would be great. Um, of course, these other ones are also awfully cool. You know, extra dimensions would be pretty cool, and the multiverse would be pretty cool. Um, a lot of people say that that's somehow not testable, you know, because these other universes are over there, and we, we'll never see them. We can't interact with them. Um, and in some ways, yes, but actually, if you had one of these situations, like these little bubbles, that pop off and you make another universe, they can leave observational imprints when you look out on the sky. So there could actually be some observational evidence that not necessarily the, the multiverse exactly, but that there are these other kind of bubbling universe things going on. So they're all very interesting. Supersymmetry is pretty compelling, um, and it has, you know, very satisfying. So, um, in the middle, I think he, he was for, yeah. Right, right. So it's a good, it's a good question. So the, the question was, given that there's such a huge array of possibilities of things that could pop up in the experiments, and you know we're also looking for lots of them, uh, when you when you go look, uh, how do you protect yourself from what's sometimes called a multiple testing problem? So the idea is that if you look in a thousand places, you know there's a pretty good chance that even if there's not really something there, you'll get a one in a thousand statistical fluke that makes you think that there's something there. So how do you avoid kind of fooling yourself. Um, so that's a very good question. Um, in the case of the Higgs, it wasn't really so much of an issue because it was a, one of the most well-motivated things to look for, and it was a very specific thing. And we went and we looked and we saw exactly what we were looking for, so there wasn't really this multiplicity issue. Uh, but it is true that we're also looking for all these other things. And uh, so we do have uh, that we do have that issue. One of the ways that we protect ourselves against it is that in, while in medicine you have sort of a 95, you know, like a 5% or 95% kind of effect, you call it a discovery, and particle physics, our standard is, is a little bit less than one in a million. So it's an incredibly high standard to be able to claim a discovery, uh, and it's scrutinized it. You know, the, we don't make discoveries very often, you know, the, it's sort of once every 10 years or something. So we look for a lot, we ask for an incredibly high level of of statistical confidence, and uh, we try to appreciate your question as much as possible and take it into account. <laughs> I think is the best answer. John, please. Yes. My question is: um, you mentioned that you can actually have like the spawning of other universes. 
Is that something that could be predicted, like with, with, with a small bang to it, or like a, a bang to the earth, or, um, or is it something that has to be observ observable? Right. So, um, so, so the question is, when you talk about these multiple universes sort of popping off, like I had this little picture, is that like really predicted? So, um, totally independent from the, the line of argument that I presented here, which had to do with the Higgs and all these kinds of things, um, when when this this if you see at the very beginning of this picture, it says inflation, and so the size of the universe, you see, it started as a point and very rapidly grew. And then it kind of settled down, and now it's still expanding. But this very rapid period of uh, of, of expansion is called inflation, and it was it was predicted partially because uh, when we looked out at the sky, it was sort of so uniform, and places that weren't that were so far apart from each other that there wasn't enough time for light to get from one to the other. They, for instance, had almost exactly the same temperature, and so there's no causal way for you know, this part of the universe to know how hot it was over there, so how could they have exactly the same temperature? So uh, Alan Guth is one of the people that presented, uh, proposed this idea of inflation, that you know, the universe was kind of small, rapidly, rapidly expanded, and that it solves lots of problems, and it's and is backed up by a lot of evidence at this point. So it's a very solid uh, idea, uh, but when you really try to do it very rigorously, uh, it turns out that there's some, some issues there, and so one of, so one of the issues is called there are these ideas called internal inflation and all these things. And, the, and the, the problem was that if you can do that, then you would expect exactly this kind of thing, that it wouldn't just happen once. It would start to happen lots of places. And actually, the, there would be so many of them that it kind of gets out of control and it's, it's hard to understand like what you even mean by like the universe. So that's where this idea of the multiverse came. So those ideas were there independently. And uh, so it is, in some sense, a prediction but a lot of people don't like the prediction. They're trying to, they see it as not as a feature, but as a problem, and they're trying to come up with a new theory of inflation that doesn't do that. But it's certainly plausible, and people have a hard time not seeing that. So, um, and then, then the question was, is it observable? And so th there, um, there are people that are working on ideas that if this did happen, then it's sort of the boundary of these, you can think of them as bubbles expanding on that boundary, uh, it might leave some sort of, if that boundary is sort of, not too far away, something that we can see, it would, it would actually leave an a, a observable imprint on this kind of blue and green looking thing, that, that, that face of where the universe becomes opaque. And so people look for them, and every once in a while people even say, claim evidence that they see them, but that's not, nothing solid, so it's possible. More questions? Other people in the audience? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Does the Earth's gravitational um, field have any effect on the particles or waves form in the particles that are? Right. So the question was, does the the, the Earth's uh, gravitational field affect what's going on? So. Right. Um. So the. Um. I guess how do, how do I want to say it? All right. It it. The accelerator, there's a way that's probably not the interesting way that it definitely does. The, the, the ring is so big, and, and the level of precision that we have to have for you know, doing all of this is so high that uh, we can tell where the moon is, uh, if the train is going by, uh, the level of water in Lake Geneva. All those things have to be corrected for in order to make the thing work. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's really totally fascinating that it, it works. Uh, um, then there's a kind of deeper picture of like, you know, is gravity interacting with the particles while it's going around or are they like, fall? Um, and there it is, but the, the level, it's not, it's all completely negligible. Um, people do other kinds of experiments, very controlled, careful experiments with different kinds of particles uh, where they try to see the effects of gravity and quantum mechanics. And some of those experiments are even done at, at CERN. So for instance, CERN just recently announced that they were able to make uh, they make, can make antiparticles like the antiparticle of an electron and then the different quarks and things to be able to make antiprotons, right? And so, and then you can put them together to make anti-hydrogen. So you have anti-atoms. And for instance, there was a question, do, does antimatter fall up? <laughs> right, so, so they actually did those experiments and no, it falls down. But the, uh, um, so there's a very serious question when people do those kinds of experiments, but it's not very relevant for the, for the collaborative. 
yeah, because to get those particles to go around, we, we have to have incredibly strong magnets and stuff. And, and the, Well, yeah, we use magnets and things, so it's like the electromagnetic forces are like kajillions of times larger than the gravitational effects. But. Yes, please. Right. So the question, the question was about the uh, transparent lead uh, and where do we get it? To, so um, it's a crystal, so uh, you actually can, you can grow a crystal. Um, so usually what you do is you have some kind of like pressurized environment where the, you get the, you know, the temperature and the pressure just perfectly. It's not that different than when you see like crystals that form inside the earth, right? You have all the ingredients that you need and the pressure and the temperature are just right and they start to grow these crystals. So you can do that in a, in a controlled laboratory kind of setting. And uh, so you can grow these big, huge crystals and they, I don't know how much, it was a millions of dollars to build, to grow those crystals. And in that case, you know, the ingredients are lead and tungsten and things and they form some particular, you know, uh, crystalline shape that turns out to be clear. Um, and, but that's important. And so the two things that we want, lead is very heavy. And uh, so when these particles are, so you, you collide these protons at like the speed of light, you hopefully make some, you know, new particles that come flying out. They're, they're also moving at the speed of light. They're very, very, very energetic. And if you want to measure their energy, you need to stop them. If they fly out of the detector, you don't know how much energy they had when they flew out, right? So you have to stop them to be able to measure their energy. And, it, and you know, you saw how big the detectors were. We don't build them that big for fun. We build them that big because that's how much lead it takes to stop them. Um, so if you used aluminum or something, it would have to be even bigger, right? So you want to make some, so you could just fill the whole thing up with lead and you'd stop them, but, but then you can't, you can't measure them, right? Because they're stuck in the lead, right? So you need to somehow be able to stop them and measure them. So how do you measure them? So one, there's a couple basic principles. One is that you put some, like a layer of lead to slow it down, and then you have a layer of something that's like a light gas or something. And so when the particles fly through, they you know, pump into the, the particles, the atoms along the way, they ionize it, and then we, then we can see that ionized uh, uh, electricity. We put some little wires there, we see a little blip of electricity, and we measure how big the blip is, and that's how we know the energy of the particle. Um, in the other case, the lead one, what happens is it disturbs all the atoms inside while it's being stopped, and then so the atoms, the electrons that are going around kind of get excited, and when they settle back down, it emits light. And then the light, if you want to absorb the light, you better have a clear thing. So we use a clear piece of lead, basically, so then the light travels around, bounces around, and then we have a little like camera, essentially, that measures how bright the light is. And the more energetic, the brighter the light. Yes, please. Right, that's a good question. So the, the question was, uh, well, Carl Sagan liked talking about us as being you know, made of stardust and things, and, and, uh, and so for, for our bodies, like how many stars have we gone through? So when the universe, we had this amazing moment where the universe became clear, and there were atoms, and then they, it was also dark at the time, and it took some time for all those atoms to get together and, and get crunched together, and the dark matter, that amazing scaffolding of dark matter helped that happen, and then they, formed in the stars that burned, and at the time there was really only hydrogen and helium around, and these first stars were kind of interesting, and they, they burnt up their nuclear fuel, and then they exploded. And in the process of doing that, they made heavier uh, elements. And the, um, so I don't know what the, I think it's, maybe someone knows a better number, but I think it's in, of the order of sort of four rounds or so, is that the, something like that? You know, it's not like, it's not thousands of rounds of stars, so the, um, and actually there's been, some excitement recently about if we, we can actually see some of the very first stars. It's not really clear if we've been able to see them or not. But the, um, so then it takes certain kinds of uh, you know, really spectacular explosions to be able to make heavier elements. So like my gold ring uh, really required very special kinds of explosions. So, um, so yeah, so that's, yeah, I think you know, roughly four and, uh, and all of the all the bling is uh, from big explosions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, do you guys have any more questions? Can we wrap up? I cannot see anyone in 
I see. Yeah. 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 Yes, please. Yeah. Ah, okay, so uh, the question was, uh, you know, the public is familiar with E equals MC squared, but could we expect any similar relationship between uh, dark energy and dark matter? And I think I now see where that's coming from in the sense that E is energy and M is matter. Um, at this point, there's no, there's no relationship between them. Um, trying to think if, uh, trying to interpret it in a, in a, uh, generous way. Um, I mean, I think if you did have some sort of ultimate theory that was able to explain what dark energy is and what's going on there um, that tied the particle physics and the, and the evolution of the universe together in one framework, then they would be related in this, but in, the, in a much more elaborate way. It's something like what I showed with the standard model. So it would be part of some, there would be one equation in principle that could relate them, but it wouldn't be, it certainly wouldn't be uh, as simple as E equals MC squared. What's the current thinking on why there is apparently more matter than antimatter created in the universe? Right, so the question is, what's the current thinking about why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe? Um, so first, it's great that you know that. Um, so antimatter uh, is real. I, I've taught classes to, to like my uh, incoming students, and I'll, I'll do a questionnaire at the beginning, and I'll say, you know, who thinks antimatter is real? And like, you know, 10% of the audience raise their hand, and like, who thinks black holes are real? 90% of the audience raises their hands. It's really funny to me because we've known about antimatter since, you know, the 30s or whatever, and black holes were a nice idea, but we didn't have like observational evidence of them until fairly recently. But uh, so antimatter is definitely real. Uh, there isn't, there aren't like anti galaxies floating around or anything. And so you would think that at the beginning, you know, if matter and antimatter hit each other, they annihilate. Uh, and so why is there, why did it favor one over the other? And that's, that is actually, if, when we talk as a field about what are the big questions uh, uh, and what is the evidence that there has to be physics beyond the standard model, uh, the big ones are dark matter, why is matter dominant over antimatter, and then, and then a, a few other ones. So we know what the requirements of a theory are for that to work. They're called the Sakharov conditions and they have to do with things like, uh, we call it CP violation, this idea that uh, parity is like looking at the, what the universe would look like in a mirror sort of, and then C is sort of going from matter to antimatter and the question is does the theory look the same if you could you know, go from a R universe to a universe that was sort of in a mirror where all the particles turned into antiparticles. And so we have some understanding about what the conditions are, to, but we, and there are various theories that can try to do it, but um, in the standard model, it's not sufficient to be able to explain why there's so much more matter than antimatter. So it's one of the big questions. We sort of know what you need, but we don't have any evidence for a theory that satisfies, you know, that's the, the mechanism. Right, so the question is, should you be worried that we're going to destroy the Earth with microscopic black holes? Um, uh, it, it's very easy to laugh that one off and just be like, no, blah, blah, we know what we're doing. Um, I think it's a very good question. Uh, maybe I'll just, uh, well, I'll say briefly that uh, I'm from Arkansas and uh, in Jacksonville, Arkansas, there was a big military plant where they made Agent Orange for Vietnam and stuff and afterwards, you know, they had all this toxic stuff laying around and they wanted to get rid of it and it was this concentrated dioxin sludge, which is incredibly toxic. And there were hundreds of thousands of barrels of dioxin sludge, okay? And Arkansas is in Tornado Alley. So it was a miracle that over 20 years, a tornado didn't come and distribute it around Arkansas. Um, and so at some point they said, well, we need to get rid of this stuff. And the way that you get rid of it is you incinerate it. You make a fire that's so hot that it breaks it apart and, you know, and so you do it, but then what you see is a smokestack with stuff coming out. And of course, that concerns the public, right? Um, and so the, you know, the chemists are saying, well, you know, we, this is totally safe, it's destroyed, et cetera. The public is like, you're burning dioxin sludge and there's smoke coming out, I'm worried. 
So my father was involved in doing this study where we're just going to, we're gonna go measure people's blood levels and all these things. And it's very important that you know, we take it seriously. So I, I always think of that with the, with the black hole question. So, um, so at CERN, there are lots of arguments, theoretical arguments about why you shouldn't be worried that these black holes will evaporate almost instantaneously and X, Y, and Z. Um, I think they're, they're all fairly good arguments, except for they're also all based on stuff that's all very speculative, I would say, on the theoretical side. So to make me comfortable, I would like something a little bit more based in you know, like empirical evidence, right? So the empirical evidence that this is not a problem is that we're being hit by cosmic rays uh, all the time that have energies much, much higher than what we can do at the LHC. And uh, you know, things all throughout the universe are getting hit by these particles. So if those kinds of collisions made black holes that destroyed the Earth, you can figure out, it's actually a calculation and a measurement about what's the rate of these cosmic particles and et cetera, and you, you can show that yes, we would, we would not be here today if those kinds of interactions made black holes that destroyed the Earth. And it was, to, you know, it was serious studies that were done. And so, and you know, we have, I have a family too. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so I, can, I can say with a, and a, that's, that's my preferred answer to the question is that empirically there's a lot of evidence that says that we are not going to destroy the Earth. Oh. Okay. 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 So, um, I guess that with all these open questions about how the heat stops that matter or transit matter and the blue space uh, with black holes, not having our answer about 50 years, yes. we would like to thank uh, Kyle for this absolute <laughs> Thank you.